you for joining us online. Here at the house, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. If you have a testimony, please send it to amen at hotl.church. If House of the Lord has impacted you in any way and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click the top right. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the message and have a great day. In Ephesians 4, 7 through 8, but to each one of us, grace, somebody say grace. grace. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a captive, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts. Somebody say gifts. He gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men. God is a giver. There is a gifting. We are givers. Our culture, really, our culture is inundated with giftings. You don't show up somewhere without a gift. Amen. Everything is basically because our DNA is to give. So I want to give you a really quick recap. It is the nature of God to give. And it's in our nature and culture as well. Jesus said this. He said, it's better to give than to receive. He didn't say it wasn't good to receive. He just said, there's a better way and that's to give. Okay. So as we unpack this and and just kind of really quick recap for all of you that were maybe uh, camping and had family and had fun things and barbecues on Memorial Day weekend. Amen. Bless you. Man, the weather was just not great, but some of you are such diehards, you didn't even care. I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm not camping on this weekend. And then I heard people like, it was the best. So here's a couple declarations. Spiritual gifts declare the presence of the Holy Spirit. When you see spiritual giftings and they're moving, the Holy Spirit's moving, it declares the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now the fruit of the Spirit declare the, the character of the Holy Spirit. You should expect the Holy Spirit to seem like Jesus. The Holy Spirit actually points to Jesus. Amen? So, so whenever you, we're kind of walking through this, there's maybe some different thoughts that we need to have. Last week, I used and, and defined the term spirit-filled or spirit-empowered, which I, I tend to like a little bit better. But I want to talk this morning just for a moment about the word charismatic. The word charismatic. We, we throw the word charismatic. Our culture throws the word charismatic around in a lot of ways that really aren't biblical. They'll say, oh man, he is so charismatic. She is so charismatic. Hollywood talks about charismatic actors and, and sports figures. And, and they're, they're, they're just charismatic. They draw people, etc., etc., etc. But we want to look at what the biblical form, biblical term of charismatic is. In Christian screen, streams, it carries a different meaning as we look at this. The charismatic movement began in the early 60s and it differentiated from the Pentecostal movement, which started earlier, but the roots were the same. The, the basic difference was the Pentecostal movement took a stance that the only evidence of the infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. That's, that's, that was their stance. The charismatic or the neo-Pentecostal movement, which basically had the same roots, they took the stance that that could be an evidence and most, mostly an evidence, but the other gifts of the Spirit, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, et cetera, et cetera, were also evidence. And so that tongues was not the only evidence. And that was really kind of the the basic difference between the two, if you will. And simply, a charismatic church believes in the present person and working of the Holy Spirit. You know, a church that does not believe that, that when the Scripture was canonized, that would be the fall into the more of the theological camp of what would be cessationism or cessationist church. We are not a cessationist church. We believe, I believe, we firmly believe that if the gifts of the Holy Spirit were given... Uh, to the early church because they were needed, that those gifts are still resonant, operating, and needed today. That's just our position. Amen? So as we, as we break that open a little bit, the, the, the Greek word charisma or plural would be charismata is actually formed from two words. One is gift 
or one is grace and one is gift. So it's grace, gift, grace, gift. That's the, that, that, that comes together to, to form that word charisma. And, it, and it's important to unpack that because if it's a gift, that means that you didn't deserve it. If it's a gift, you didn't earn it. If, you, if it's a gift, you didn't hold your mouth right. And so you got it. If it's a gift, you know, you just didn't pray more than anybody else. And so now you're like, oh, elevated, right? I mean, because that's, that's part of what happens a lot of times when we see the gifts operating. If we're not careful, we can basically develop kind of a pride thing because, you know, show me yours, I'll show you mine, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's a gift, you didn't earn it. And ultimately, you don't own it. You don't own it. The operation of it is from God. It's from the Holy Spirit. It's from Jesus. And have you ever shown up at a party, for example, where, you know, it's lots of graduation parties, lots of birthday parties, lots of stuff going on right now. Amen? I'm getting inundated with all kinds of stuff. It's like, I can't go to them all. I love these young people. But you show up to one of those places with a gift, correct? I mean, there's been times when my wife and I are going somewhere and they're like, oh man, we got to stop because we need to get a card. We need to get a gift because you don't show up empty handed. Can I say this? The Holy Spirit does not show up empty handed. It's awkward. Every once in a while we get caught and it's like, oh, we're here at this, whatever it is. I don't have a, do you have, you got a, you got a $50 bill in your pocket. Do you got a card? We got to give And if you almost, how, how many of you ever showed up to a party and you felt like a little guilty because you didn't bring something to the table. Come on. The Holy Spirit never shows up empty-handed. Okay? And so I want, you to, I want you to revisit, if you're taking notes, I want you to revisit this title. Because the title is The Gifts of Relationship. Well, we're going to emphasize, we're going to talk about the gifts, we're going to talk about the function, but I really want to emphasize the relationship. That's so important. I want to get back to that caution that I had last week. I had three cautions last week. Make sure that your emphasis and attention is on the giver and not the gift. Now, we, 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 how, in Acts 8, 14 through 20, we see a, 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 a passage that talks about that. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. These were already followers. And now there was this, what some circles will call a second grace, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that's even a trigger. Like, oh, you know, that, those, those kind of people. But let's just follow the Scripture and see what happens. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Because he saw, this is really super cool. Stuff is half spiritual. Stuff is happening. And he offered them money. And he said this, give, give this authority to me so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Remember, the gifts are given. They're not earned. They're not bought. They're not purchased. They're given, right? So Simon has this major fail here where he wasn't interested in knowing the Holy Spirit, but he's focused on the stuff, and the stuff is not the goal. At the same time that I say that, the stuff is not the goal. There's this tension that we've got to manage. Now, I'm going to give you this little nugget here that I wish I had learned a lot earlier in life. When you're faced with situations, how many of you got situations right now? You're just like, man, I've got some situations. What I've learned to do, what I heard, what I've learned to do is assess, is this a problem or is this a tension? Problems you, you, you solve, tensions you manage, right? You got a problem with your teenage kid, you're not going to solve that. You're going to manage that because it's a tension, it's really not a problem. It's just a tension. Okay? Uh, so when we look at that, here's this tension. Because now we see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 20, where Paul writes, don't quench the Spirit. He says, do not despise prophetic utterances. And, and it's really important for us to know that, that 
what we believe and what we, because this is what scripture teaches is that the, the operation of the prophetic still works through God's people today. Now it's not like the old Testament. There's a different boundaries and a grace on it for exhortation, the building up and the edifying of the body. It's got to actually come in line with Scripture. It's not above Scripture. But we believe that if, if the Holy Spirit is working in you, that Jesus can speak, the Holy Spirit can speak through you to another person. Okay? And, 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 so we, and, and then we see this um, in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 13, where Paul writes, Therefore, my brethren, desire, desire earnestly, somebody say, desire earnestly, to prophesy and to not forbid to speak in tongues. Ooh, and then in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it says, but earnestly desire, earnestly desire, there's that word again, earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I will, show, I will show you still a more excellent way. So, the greater gifts, for one, I believe is the gift that's needed the most at the time. I believe that's how the Holy Spirit works. I've just seen it. If, if I see that, you know, my, my brother over here has run off the road and I show up and I've got my shotgun because I got just done hunting, but then my other brother shows up and he's got a floor jack. What gift is needed the most to get him out of the ditch? Right? It's kind of simple when we, when we walk through this. And then the other tension in the passage is that earnestly desire. This is pretty interesting because earnestly desire is translated covet. Okay, so wait a minute. The Bible says, thou shalt not covet. And yet when it comes to the gifts, it actually says, hey, hey, hey except for that, covet those. It's like, it's like there's, there's passages in the Bible like that. Like, for example, we see, uh, we see in, the, in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet, right? But yet when we go to Malachi, and it comes to tithing, uh, or, or, or I'm sorry, it says, uh, thou shalt not, and in the Bible it says, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. But then when we come to Malachi, it says, when it comes to our giving and tithing, it says, test me in this and see. So it's like, well, wait a minute. Here's this tension that we manage. Okay, how do we, how do we manage this tension? I, my, my life has been absolutely impacted by prophetic ministry. People that I trust, and I'm not talking about some wing nut parking lot prophet that just decides they got a word. I'm talking about trusting, trusting the character in somebody. And, and, and years ago, Robbie and I were serving in our home church in Okanagan, and we were just, I mean, we were, we were probably younger than, than Pastor Stephen was, and, and Lisa, we were like youth pastors, and then associate pastors, and then worship pastors, and, and then snow shovelers, and whatever it took, you know, we were just serving the house, and there's a really, there's a really amazing dynamic friend that I, that I met back there. His name is DeWitt Jones, and we've had his daughter Doe here a couple times. And, and he's just, prophetic ministry just, just flows through this guy. So he, he, he prophesies over us. He gives us a word. And he said this, he said, God's going to take you and send you to a place. And we didn't think we were going anywhere. We're just like, we're planted, we're rooted. He, we're rooted. he said, he's going to send you to a place where your music will be a household name to them because Robbie and I were, you know, musical and we were traveling and we were, you know, we were doing some conferences. We were leading worship at conferences and different things. He said, your music is going to be a household uh, word to them. They will know you, but you won't know them. And when they hear that you're coming, they will weep. Now that's like, ooh, I wonder if he had like pizza last night. I have no idea. There's no way I'm going to try to fulfill that. I can't, I, I just, I, I forgot about it. Like, oh, cool. That's a, that's a word. We'll just see what God's going to do. Probably eight or nine years later, God called us out of Okanagan to pastor in a church in McCall, Idaho. And what we found out, it was a confirmation. What we found out was this church had actually attended some of the conferences that we led music at. Our music and some of our recordings were a household name to them. And then they knew us, but we didn't know them. And then I was talking to a, one of the board members and her daughter, and they said, when we heard that you guys were coming to pastor the church, we were in my mom's kitchen and we cried. And it just immediately brought me back 
to that word I got probably seven or eight years before, and it confirmed. Because there's times when you're like, um, am I really supposed to be here? And then, bam, and it just ties you in, and it's like, oh God, this is absolutely what we're doing. The prophetic word has touched my life. It's got to be governed. It's got to be in its rightful place. It can't be something weird and crazy. But the tension is that you have to major on experiencing the relationship and not just experiencing the stuff. Because over the years, I've seen people run from experience to experience and never be rooted. I mean, conference junkies. God's moving over here. We're going over here. We're going over there. They never plant and they never root. You've got to be rooted because you can't chase after the stuff. Make sure the goal is not the experience or you turn things into a spiritual repetition. There was a, a meeting that we did years and years and years ago. It was before we came up here. It was service and all that. It was, it was amazing, amazing service. And we were debriefing the meeting with some staff people. And one of the guys on the staff said, man, I just feel like we missed it. I'm like, what do you mean we, we missed it? He said, I felt like there, was just, there wasn't a prophetic word. There wasn't a, anything, you know, come up. And I, I'm like, inside me, I just was so irritated because in that same service, I think 10, 12, 13 people got saved. And I'm like, wait a minute. You are absolutely have this thing. But the greatest gift is salvation. And when you start trying to elevate one gift over another, but I'm telling you what, I love to see healing. I love to see prophetic words, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. But I would, to me, the top of the top is seeing somebody open the heart, the door of their heart, and come into the kingdom of God. And, and, and angels are rejoicing. And, and I, I'm serious, it just transforms everything. So we have, to really, we have to really be careful. Pastor Jack Hayford wrote this. Some of the sins of the religious repetition that have come upon the Spirit-filled church of Jesus Christ are, number one, where the working of the Spirit is forced and truly not a natural flow of the Spirit. Number two, where the people are not prostrated by the power of the Spirit, but by the power of suggestion. And number three, where people are shouted into some kind of response in order to generate a testimony that doesn't last when they leave the room. We need a solid theology of the Holy Spirit. And you can be spiritual without being weird. But that doesn't mean at times that the spiritual activity will never be uncomfortable. Because it's interacting with natural, spirit and natural stuff come in and they collide and stuff happens. See, I've seen people laugh when the Holy Spirit is just present and moving. I've seen people cry. I've seen people weep. I've seen people do nothing. And then sometimes like, well, he's not doing nothing. Holy Spirit must not. How do you know that? Stop that. I'm a very stoic person. I've just, I've been overwhelmed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But when people are looking at me, they're like, okay, what's going on? Well, I, inside, I am absolutely just being transformed, wrecked, messed up, healed, delivered, whatever it might be. And you're trying to judge something from the outside to what might be going on the inside. We can't do that. We've got to stop doing that stuff. Right? And, and, and it's like, like, for example, I'm different. When I, when I encounter the Holy Spirit, I'm so different from my wife. When she encounters the Holy Spirit, she's, she, there's joy. I remember the first time I just saw her get wrecked in the service and it's was like, she's just laughing, man. I'm like, what is going on over there? Well, no, you know, Holy Spirit is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's like, okay, we just anchored that bad boy. Or we'll see, we'll see God encounter somebody and we'll see them fall over, right? Okay, that's cool. I was doing a, I was leading worship for a service years and years ago and, and I had an organist and the, 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 the Lord was just moving, man. I, mean, I don't know about you. When, when we come together, I want God to move and do what He wants to do. I don't want to just play church. I don't want to go through some liturgy and then, hey, we've, you know, we've checked it off our list. Got to worship in, got the Word in, got the whatever, we're good. I want to cultivate the presence of the Holy Spirit moving in our life. So anyway, we're leading worship and God was moving and suddenly I lost my organ. It's like it went, it went away. I'm like... I'm playing. I'm like looking back there. She's actually laying on the platform. I'm like, what the heck? You know? 
So I actually went over and talked to her. I was like, hey, what's going on? I mean, I did. I'm curious. I'm young. I want to figure out what's going on. And she just looks at me and she says, I don't know, honey. She's old enough to be my mom, so it felt like my mom was talking to me. She says, I, I, I don't know, honey, but I just feel the peace of the Lord on me. And all those years of raising kids has just washed off me. I thought, praise God, man. That's awesome. See, the natural person has different reactions when they impact the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is we try to make a doctrine out of it. I mean, you can't find anything in the Bible that talks about being slain in the Spirit. But I can show you several instances in the Bible where people encountering the power of God would fall down. If they want to fall down, it's okay, it's cool. But don't make a doctrine about it. And then you'll have people that'll argue, well, you know what? If they fall forward, it's Jesus. If they fall backwards, it's Satan. Stop it! Seriously! Stop it! Knock it off! We get so caught up with that stuff, and no wonder people think, y'all a bunch of freaks, man. You're weird. We got to hold these tensions, and we got to balance these things. Now, I've also seen, and this is where I just want you to hang in there, just buckle up a little bit. I've also seen the, you know, remember the word manifestation from last week is open showing. The manifestation, a lot of times we hear that word and we're, ooh, manifestation. It simply means to openly show. You know, if I took my coat off right now and showed you my shirt, I'm openly showing, right? I'm just, I'm, it's not a weird, scary word. But I've also seen the open showing of demonic acti activity. Right. And sometimes that's where we're like, whoa, pastor, don't go there, man. You know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But we have to recognize that 25% of what Jesus did was actually was freeing people from demonic influences. He said, if I drive out demons, the finger of God, the, 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 the kingdom of God has come upon you. So we can't be, I remember the first time, I'd never seen this stuff. I'm just going to give you a couple stories. I'd never seen this stuff. Went to my first mission trip in the Philippines. I'm a, I'm a good associate pastor. I got my theology. It's good. Going to the Philippines, going to change the world. I'm paired up with this pastor, four score pastor from Colorado, and the, the, the native Filipino pastor, which was really cool because he used to be the number one wanted man in the Philippines, and now he's pastoring a church. That's a God transformation. But anyway, he says, he said, so uh, uh, how are you guys at with just uh, you know, delivering somebody from a demon? And we're like, cool. Let's get it on. Let's rock. I've never really been around it before. And so I started asking him, we're in the car and we're on the way. And so I started asking, well, what, what, what makes you think that this, this uh, young guy in your congregation is like, you know, demon possessed? He said, well, he uh, can't quit drinking beer, can't quit smoking cigarettes. I'm like, well, sounds like some bad habits and maybe some addiction he needs to be free of. And uh, whenever a pastor shows up at his house, he opens the window and jumps out. That's demonic. No, you know what I'm saying? So we kind of go in there, and this guy comes in. He's a, he's a clean-cut, great-looking young guy. Looks like he just got out of Harvard or something like that. We sit down, and very quiet-spoken. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Can we just pray for you? We started praying for him, and all hell broke loose. It was, it was crazy. It was like, I'm seriously, it was crazy. It was like, whoa, this is not in my theological comfort zone. But we saw him get delivered. So I've seen people manifest. I've seen screams. I've seen shrieks. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and then I'm going to address something, it's called the discerning of spirits. The gift of discernment of spirits or distinguishing between spirits. The Greek word for the gift of discernment is diacresis. And the word describes being able to distinguish, discern, judge, or apprise a person, a statement, a situation, or an environment. Do you remember when Jesus, or uh, yeah, Jesus was about ready to go um, into uh, the city and 
Peter tried to stop him, and Jesus turned around and said, get behind me, Satan. That was the, that was the gift of discernment. He realized, and I'm thinking, oh, Peter, dude, you know, but it's like Jesus recognized it. So um, the word describes being able to uh, dis, uh, discern these things. In the New Testament, it describes the ability to distinguish between spirits, good or evil. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to I want to be careful with this. I want to hold this with attention. Because one of the trigger words, controversies, between this is oppression or possession. Can a Christian be possessed? Or is a Christian oppressed? I want to just address this for a moment. First of all, um, to me the best illustration is that you, you own your own home, but if robbers come in, they're still not possessing my home, but i got to get them out. When I look at a lot of Scripture that talks about the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to the Lord, when I look at when somebody basically accepts Christ, they're actually sealed. You know, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. I come to the conclusion that sometimes we're dealing with some, some, some semantics and we're kind of doing some sword fights, but the reality is that we have the opportunity, if I leave my door open, if I leave my window undone, uh, fiery darts can come in, and that robber that comes in can do all kinds of damage, and no matter whether I think it's possession or oppression, that thing's got to get out. There's an illegal entry. But don't get caught up in that, because sometimes we just argue over that. All I'm knowing is I've seen God's people that, you know what, we have eye gates, we have ear gates, we have pathways in, and we allow the... And if you, if you actually break down the Scripture in the New Testament, most of the time the word is not like demon-possessed, it means demonized. So I'm more comfortable with that, because then it kind of makes both camps feel like I'm being heard. Amen? we got to hold these things with attention. And then the other thing that I want to give you caution about is you have to be trained in this. This is not Lone Ranger stuff. It says this in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature. So there's the, there's, there's the qualifier. And those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is not for sissies. It's not for the immature. It's not something that you should be like, hey, you know what, I'm like, you know, Mr. Demon Hunter. Listen, I, that makes me totally uncomfortable. I never saw Jesus do that. He just went around doing good and he'd encounter it and he'd say, hey, you know what, I'm discerning something here. Get out. Let's, let's, you know, let's go to battle. Let's free some people up. Don't make it this huge thing. But don't shy away from it because it's not your comfort zone. Because there's a lot of spiritual things that aren't comfortable. Amen? So I want to get back to the Holy Spirit. You guys all hanging with me? The Holy Spirit, this is important, is a person. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not an influence. Okay? Considering the Holy Spirit a mere influence is not scriptural. Considering the Holy Spirit as an influence will hinder worship as, and at its heart, worship is relational in nature, and you can't have a relationship with just an influence. Right? So, when I think about this, Jesus used pronouns in describing the Holy Spirit as He, Himself, you know, He will come, and they're all gender masculine, which I think is really cool too. (laughs) But the Scripture shows that the Holy Spirit has personal qualities. And I'm saying this because this is about the gifts of relationship. The whole point of this is you need to be, I'm trying to move you from a point where the Holy Spirit is like crazy Uncle Larry that might show up and you're not sure what's going to happen to where you're inviting him and cultivating and understanding I need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. More people are comfortable with, you know, the uh, Father God and Jesus, but don't realize, hey, listen, that the triune nature of God, it's all together, three in one. So the scripture shows the Holy Spirit has personal qualities. Number one, he has a mind. Romans 8, 27, and he who searches the hearts knows the mind, what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Number two, he has a will. 
1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. The next one, he has emotions. Romans 15, 30 says, now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He can speak. The Holy Spirit speaks. Acts 8, 29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. He makes decisions. Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. He can be grieved. The Holy Spirit, an influence doesn't get grieved. An influence doesn't have a will, have emotions, make decisions. He can be grieved. It says in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit can be insulted, lied to, resisted. And the Holy Spirit is not some distant third party of the triune nature of God. The gifts, the manifestation, the open showing show the Holy Spirit is present and always points to Jesus. Magnifying Jesus. I think this is so important because Jesus said this, these things and more will follow those who believe. How is He going to do that? He's going to do that by sending the Holy Spirit. He said this, He said, it is to your advantage that I go. Because if I go, the counselor will come. He will counsel you. He will convict the words of his citizen. He will bring into judgment. I mean, the Holy Spirit is moving. And it's almost like when we see the Holy Spirit move, we experience the Holy Spirit move, we're actually seeing what Jesus would be doing if he was here in the flesh walking with us. And because there's this tension, there's a tension in the gifts. Paul had to write to bring order. Many times we shy away, talk around, we don't develop or we don't exercise the gifts because of the potential controversy. Amen. How many of you recognize the value of exercise? How many of you exercise? You know what I'm saying. How many of you got that gym downstairs and all it is is glorified clothes hanger? In your mind, you know, but you don't exercise. This is really important. Bill Scheidler uh, wrote this. I love this. He said this, Too often the church has been like an NFL football game. 22 players on the field desperately in need of rest and 40,000 fans in the stadium desperately in need for exercise. (laughs) Right? It's not just for a select few people. In Acts chapter 2, it took Joel, the, the scripture out of Joel, and it said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and your daughters, your old men, your young men, they will dream, they'll prophesy. There's, that was the promise to the church. It's the equipping. A vibrant relationship with the Holy Spirit will not leave you in the spectator section. And He doesn't show up empty-handed. The same Holy Spirit that hovered and moved at the beginning of creation, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writing of the Bible lives in you and I. And and, and have you ever, think about this, have you ever read a great impacting book and wished you could have a relationship with the author? Now there's some like authors, I don't have no relationship with them. Back in the day, I read a couple Stephen King novels. Like, I don't want to, that dude's weird, man. <laughs> but think about this when you, look at, when you look at this. Have you, in 2 Peter 1, 20, verse 21, it says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture, if you got your Bible, all Scripture is breathed out by God, that's the Holy Spirit, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The triune nature of God, each come with a set of gifts that work within you. 
to the Father in Romans chapter 12. We see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit. We see, we see the, uh, the fivefold ministry, uh, the giftings in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 that Jesus gave, first of all, apostles, uh, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the equipping of the church. So we see like there's this plethora. There's this thing that, that works together. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit... That's the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 says, In the varieties of service, but the same Lord. That's Jesus. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. That's the Father. That's the, the entire personhood of the Godhead is working in you and I. Let, let, let me look at one more scripture to illustrate this, and I think our worship team is going to come up. I think it's, it's so important, once again, it's about the gifts of relationship. And you got to hold them. How many of you have ever been in a relationship with someone that you realized as you got into it that they were just there because of what you had or your giftings? You know, I, I, and you go, well, that's super awkward. I don't want people to be in a relationship with me because of I got a great boat. Right? Or I have, or I can, you know, whatever. You get my point. It's really important that we develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit because, once again, I think so many people in the church that's like, ah, I'm just really not sure about that. And yet Jesus said, It's to your advantage that I go because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. It's so healthy. It's so good. Now, we see earlier, I made the statement that, Je that the Holy Spirit authored the Bible, right? All Scripture is God-breathed. But now look at this, Hebrews 12, 2. This is how they work together. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author ooh, and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can I just say this this morning? You still may not understand all of this stuff. We're all in a journey trying to, I've said it probably ad nauseum, I've been married to this lady for almost 42 years. I did not know. I did not know. Good for her, man. She needed it. Seriously. No, that didn't sound right. I needed it. <laughs> when I made the commitment, the covenant with her, I didn't realize it would be 41 years that I would walk this out and in that learning about her and her learning about me. That's the journey that we have with Jesus. We take the step of faith. We make the commitment. We transfer our loyalty from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of heaven. And then we spend a lifetime in learning about who this God is and how much He loves us and how much grace that He has for us and what He wants to give us. And it's the same thing. You learn about the Father's love and you learn about what Jesus did and, and that He's now sitting at the right hand of, uh, of the Father is interceding for us. God, can you imagine? That just feels so good. Whatever you're going through, that actually Jesus is interceding for you. He's praying for you. And then the Holy Spirit, which is moving and active and activated. And we have to walk through this journey of learning this stuff. That's called discipleship. I want to say this this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to author some fresh things in your life. He never shows up empty-handed. There's been times in my life where, man, I've just felt dry. I've felt barren. I felt I'm just kind of walking through stuff. I've, I've walked through some tragedy. I've walked through some loss. I've walked through some fear and some anxiety. And I realized, God, I just, I just don't feel like, Jesus, your word said, from your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I just don't feel like there's anything flowing. And I was thinking about a river. You know, rivers flow and there's a current, but there has to be a place where they're being fed, right? It's a, it's a snowpack, it's the rain, it's a spring, and sometimes our lives can be like that. We know this, we know we should have this river in our life, but man, why is it, why is it, it's not very deep. What's going on? I need you, Jesus. 
We sang a song this morning about just our need for God. You were created to walk in the supernatural. Jesus walked as a man demonstrating the kingdom of God. That's how we're to walk. And he said, these things and more shall follow those who believe. And then maybe, finally, you're here this morning and, and you've never you've never met the author and finisher of our faith. I, I'm, I'm going to talk to somebody. Any author has to start. Any chapter has a beginning. And are you here this morning and could use a new start by believing and putting your trust in Jesus for the first time? I'm telling you, it's the most incredible step of faith and determination that you will make in your life. I want to just pray for a moment. If you just bow your heads with me. Jesus, I pray right now for anybody in this room or online. They're feeling, they're, they're sensing the draw of your love and your grace. And maybe they've known about you. But maybe they've never taken that step of faith to believe, which is more than just an intellectual belief, but it's a, it's a belief that shifts them and says, my loyalty is now into the kingdom of heaven because of my faith in Jesus. I'm going to trust in Him. If that's you here this morning, I want to celebrate with you as you make that step. I'd like you to just kind of you know, raise your hand. Let, let me agree with you. Let me celebrate with you. If you're here this morning and, and you're saying, uh, I'm going to open the door of my heart and I'm going to take the step of faith. I'm going to allow this Jesus to come in. I want to give you just a moment. Just who, who's going to agree with me? Thank you, sir. Anybody else this morning? Come on, can we just start celebrating? Anybody else this morning? You're saying, hey, today, today I'm taking the step of faith. Today I'm taking this step. Anybody else this morning? You're saying, okay, today's my day. Pastor, today's my day. It's important that we agree together. Two more in agreement. That's what Jesus said.